everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Influencing Safety with Bill Martin, the president and CEO of Think Tank Project LLC. I'm Kate Wade, the editor of Incident Prevention Magazine and your host for this podcast. And I'm really excited today because we're actually live from the IP Utility Safety Conference and Expo in San Diego. Um, and I'm here with my guest, uh, Mr. Bill Martin, um, who I get to see face to face today in person, the whole thing. So um, we're going to be talking about safety myths today. And so I just want to welcome Bill to the podcast. And uh, how are you doing this morning, Bill? Good, Kate. It's really cool to see you in 3D <laughs> instead of on a screen in 2D. Nice. And the conference has been awesome. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And a lot of good feedback from attendees. Good. And your session went well yesterday, too. It did. It did. There's some rumor that we might do a, a work pre conference workshop. Ooh. You know, to, to, it's, it was about uh, worker-centered safety, mm -hmm. and I'll call it the shift, and it might need a little more time for people to shift their mind to that Marinate idea. Urinate a little? Yeah. So it may happen. If it doesn't, I apologize for bringing it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're here this morning because we want to talk about safety myths, and there are quite a few of them from um, what I've gathered over my years in the industry. Can you tell me what you think maybe the number one or the top three myths are um, that we need to bust in this industry? Um, I, I can. <laughs> um, I, it's a loaded question. Right? It is. So, so before we even say that, I, uh, you know, I want to prepare the audience to be careful not to be defensive of this, uh -huh. just to be curious and interested why we might think things might be a myth. Because it's everybody has the best intentions. I don't know. I yesterday I asked everybody. We all agree on the things that we're seeing, these serious injuries and fatalities, and these continued, um, you know, outages, unplanned outages, and slip strips and falls. And, and they seem we seem to have a number that we can't break. Mm -hmm. So what we start to do in our best intentions is we create rituals, and mm -hmm. and we start beliefs. But then when the statistics don't change, that belief may be really true, but it hasn't translated to a change in the physical reality for the worker. Because the, the injury, just to be reminded, the injury of, in the worker doesn't really discriminate between uh, gender, religion, uh, conspiracy theory, <laughs> politics. It doesn't, it doesn't care. So what we need to do is have things that actually change something in physical reality. And when we focus on the thing that we think is is supposed to work and it doesn't, uh, and we just need to recognize it. So I don't mean this to be negative. No, of um, course not. And, and I just want to start that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's perfect. So that there, there's there's so many things, uh, but there's some things consistently happening in the industry. Uh, for example, like the safety stand down. Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting uh, occurrence, which is appears to be all across. And then. And then the job brief, you know, I, I've asked, I just was in Arizona last month and we had a round table with about 30, 30 people from, like, all from across Arizona. And I asked around, I had to write down on an index card what the main objective of the job brief was. And small clusters believe, had the same belief, mm -hmm. but different companies had different beliefs of what the objective was. And then I asked, you know, if you guys shared tools as, as, as workers, would you be able to work at, at different companies using the same tools? Because the work is the same, right? And they said, yeah. They said, well, then why are all your job briefs different if the work's the same? So we might discuss that in a minute. And what happened when you asked them that question? Well, th there was a long silence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and which leaves a big question, right? So why are they different? And I guess we can start there. Want to start there? Yeah, let's start there. All right. So... The job brief um, is a social construct to help it use as a planning aid so that we know all of the things we need to know, know so we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. But the objective of the job brief, um, we think, is, to, is the most important thing to get us ready for the job. But if you watch the way it's delivered, almost mostly in our industry, it's delivered as a narrative. And if I'm working distribution every day, the job brief looks strikingly similar every day. To the point where people have even been seen to fill them out on Monday for the week and uh, photocopy them. And, oh, no. And as, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's not with bad intentions, but, but that's, I don't mean to pick on people for doing that. That usually means something. 
mm-hmm. they're doing that. Because that means it's not of value. So what I like to say is the job brief we think is a tool, but it's not. If it was it a tool, it would be the same in every company. And it's also, I don't know, we don't, logical fallacies are something we haven't done yet, but there's one that says afterwards, therefore, because of it. Oh, it's the ergo propter hoc? Post hoc ergo propter hoc. Okay. That's Latin. Almost out. Latin, right. <laughs> and you can Google that. There's some funny things on YouTube. And that's the one where we talked about the Cheyenne, the Native Americans 200 years ago when there was a solar eclipse. Imagine 200 years ago when there was a solar eclipse and you couldn't explain it. Mm-hmm. Or the earth shook. and you couldn't, I mean, that's scary. Yeah. So we would make stuff up. And to the Native Americans, they thought it looked like a moon, uh, like a frog was eating the sun. And the sun's light is going away while the frog is eating it. So they would come out and pound on their pots and pans and dance and and uh, and make as much noise as possible. And every time they did that, the sun came back out. Wow. And not only did it come back out, but if they redid that same thing every time, it came back out every time. But it's like the correlation doesn't equal well, causation. It's, not, it's afterwards, therefore, because of it. Yeah, the sun came out. It's because we danced. <laughs> yeah. So the job brief has the same logical fallacy ring to it. I've had uh, high-level management in, in, in utility companies tell me that's the most important tool. So that's why I started asking questions. And if it's a tool, why are they all different? Mm-hmm. And, then, um, I, and then in one investigation, the same gentleman said, well, this was an inadequate job brief. And I said, oh, I am so glad you brought this up. I've been waiting for somebody to tell me what an adequate one is. He says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, first, if there was an incident and this job brief is inadequate. He said, yeah. I said, well, if you had seen the job brief before the incident, incident would it still have been inadequate? And I said, this is another question I asked in Arizona. Mm-hmm. I said, well, now that we've discussed, discussed what we think the objective is, I want you to write, you just had an incident and you're interviewing the crew. And I want you to, everybody write down now, because you're going to go look at the job reef. What are you looking for? And it, everyone was strikingly similar. You're looking for the thing that's not on it. Afterwards, therefore, because of it. Mm-hmm. So then what we do, we think the job reef, if the job goes well, it's because we had a good job reef. job goes badly, it's because we had an inadequate job reef. Because we didn't write down the thing that we thought that we didn't see, and then what we do is we start ha- working on the job brief paper itself. Let's so the one company went to eleven by seventeen four sides because evidently four pages of things that might happen is better than two. Wow! And when we start, we think making the piece of paper better makes the job safer. But the real objective of the job brief is to get our crew synchronized, and then we need to look for disruptions. And sometimes the job brief can be a disruption to them because crew shows up, they're ready to go to work, they're, we're t- tipping our heads towards each other, pointing up at the pole we're going to change, and somebody's holding a plumb bob, and then, well, wait a minute, we got to do the job reef, and we start reading, slip strips and falls, be careful of slip strips and falls, and don't get caught in the bite, you know, um, oh, and this is the circuit number, and this is and this is the closest hospital, which is another myth, by the way, and-, and uh, Yeah, we have to talk about that. All right, um, when we get to the, we're, we're going to do it now, because we're in the job reef. Okay. All right, so, so- that's a disruption. And then what we do, we sign it, which is psychologically the last thing you do before you have dinner or you buy a pair of jeans is sign the credit card receipt. Mm-hmm. Well, that's done. So psychologically, when we sign the job brief, we're done and we're unsynced. You go over to get bolts. I'm going over to the bucket and we are completely separate. And we need to get back together and get synced like we were before the job brief. Um, so that that's why I, it, it's kind of a myth because well, it's not kind of. It is a myth. We think the job brief is the most important thing, but if it is, then why do we all have different ones? Why do we all believe it has a different objective? We... Well, so how do you think it should be structured, or what are you? What are your ideas on how to improve the process or what we're doing in the job briefs? Well, you know, I love the word "and." Yes. Um, I believe we can continue what we're doing, and we can add to it to make it. Um, something that it helps us connect. Mm-hmm. So there's a little exercise. It was from uh, hospital rooms around, or operating rooms around the country, where just before they operate, this is from Atul Gawande in the Checklist Manifesto. I think I've mentioned it before. Yes, yeah. But they stand in a circle. They introduce themselves because often they don't even know each other. What's your role? What concerns do you have? And they found that when they do that, if you did this after a job brief, immediately following signing it, 
You're going to be in a circle, which screams the word team. Mm -hmm. You're going to make eye contact, which has been proven by Hanley and neurogeneration in her studies, that your brain waves synchronize. Um, you're going to, even the apprentice is going to say his role and what concern they have, which means you're going to practice speaking up every day. Mm -hmm. If you want to get good at violin, you should probably practice. Probably. And, and. Well, it, if you want to plant corn. You get corn. Yeah. yeah. If you want to get corn, you got to plant it. You're right. You're right. So, <laughs> so. And it verifies that what the foreman told you is what you understood you heard. So well, often a foreman will look up at the guy in the bucket and yell, hey, what, what, what the heck are you doing? Is that, is that what I told you? Mm -hmm. And the guy in the bucket will say, yeah, I'm doing what I thought, what I think I thought you said. But if we actually use three-way communication just after the job brief, he could verify that and that piece would be over. Right. So that's, that, that's one tactic, Kate. I mean, that's if we just, just to recognize that being synchronized and on the same page um, and, um, and thinking the same way is is more important. And it, we, we tend to use command and control instead of team. Mm -hmm. So if you're the grunt on the ground and I say, hey, you're the grunt, go get my tools. And I get in the bucket, I just created a division. We got to stop the division. We are all the same team, mm -hmm. right? And it might've worked really good in my generation, but the younger generation needs a coach and a team mentality. Um. Well, so one of the things that we were talking about in there that we mentioned briefly was was the hospital thing, and I just want to touch on that really quickly. Um, so there, we feel really good when we because that's important. We need to have the closest hospital, and everybody does it. Um, but but when does a hospital call nine one one, Kate? When they aren't able to perform whatever procedure needs to happen. Exactly. So eighty percent of the flights I was on for the twenty three years as a on a helicopter as a flight medic nurse were two hospitals mm -hmm. because either the person had become so acute they couldn't handle it or the person that got dumped off at their ER needs an operating room and either they don't have one or they don't have a surgeon. Okay. And the Center for Disease Control did the calculation. If you throw that guy in your pickup truck and bring him to a hospital that can't operate and he's bleeding, um, those seriously injured, injured trauma patients have a 25% higher mortality if they go to the wrong hospital first. So you just give a one in four higher chance of dying if I'm the hospital written on your job brief, isn't the one the guy needs. Right. And so I think one of the things we've talked about is on a lot of these briefings or in the safety plans, you know, we have the uh, the address of the closest hospital, but is it the right what it, trauma level, I guess is how you So level one trauma center, seriously injured patients should go to a level one trauma center. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's criteria for that. We're not going to become doctors, but if you maintain enough composure when you call 911, and you tell him, look, yeah, that looks like he's got, you know, both of his legs are broken, or he's he's really pale, or he's th th then the system will start to create the transport to the right place. Okay. I, I I don't know if we want to stay on this subject for a minute. Is that sure. right? Yeah, totally. So so I I was uh, I was a project bare hand project manager, and we had a project in a, in a re remote part of uh, an area out of Albany, New York, up in the, towards Troy, actually in the backwoods. And when I went, I got awarded the job. And at the pre-job meeting, the head of the company was uh, giving us all the rules where the material laydown is going to be and all the rules. And he looks at me and he says, and you need to do a landing zone because you have to have a landing zone set up for this. And I said, and he says, and I said, so you're thinking in case somebody gets seriously injured, you want to be able to expedite them getting up? He said, yes. And he said, and I said, well, you know, did you talk to the local EMS squad? He said, well, no. He said, this is your responsibility. It's part of your job. You need to set up a landing zone. And I said, well, you know, the local EMS squad actually are the experts on this. And if there's somebody serious, they probably have a landing zone somewhere in the region. Mm -hmm. He says, no, but you, that's your responsibility. I said, well, sure. I said, all due respect, um, uh, as much as you'd like to be in control of the helicopter, uh, the pilot is. And he says, well, what makes you an expert? I said, well, at that point, sir, I've been flying for 17 years on the New York State Police helicopter as a paramedic, mm -hmm. and I've landed, I've flown, hovered over landing zones on the interstate with horrid accidents, and the pilot, from his perspective, coming in, didn't like it, and went and landed in a field. So you can set up a landing zone if you like, but if the pilot decides, since he's in control of the aircraft, where he lands, he doesn't like it. It was a lot, of, big waste of time. Yep. And we spent a lot of cognitive load, worrying about things that we should, and critical thinking, worrying about things that should we give to the people that actually should be worrying about those things. Yeah, the, sub, the subject matter experts, the people who are coming in. So I think it's more important 
that you call Here's the other piece. If you have the closest hospital, you're going to be inclined to think, you know, I can get to that, this guy to the hospital faster. And if you just got an electrical contact, they're going to keep him in a hospital for 24 hours to look for arrh heart arrhythmias. If he has that arrhythmia and dies in your pickup truck, you're going to be pretty depressed about that. And you're going to drive fast. Yeah. And I've been at the ER when the passenger of the car arrives dead. It's ugly. Yeah, really. But, so we're setting up, because of that myth of closest hospital, really what we need to do is practice for that event so that we have a shared mental model of how we're going to respond to it. And we decide ahead of time when it's safe to fail that, you know, we should keep the AED with this guy, let the ambulance come and we'll go into the hospital. He's doing really well. He says he's not complaining, but, you know, the number one symptom of a serious injury in a male is denial. <laughs> so it's not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> Right. So so that's that whole job brief thing. The way it's set up, we've created, uh, I call it a myth, but it's more like, a, what would you call it? It's a, it's a ritual. Yeah, it's a ritual and it's, it's become ingrained and so we're not really thinking about it. It's sort of like, you know, one of those things where you become blind to certain things because it happens over and over again. Yeah. Um, and, you know. So, so when it becomes, so... It becomes the job rate becomes not real, becomes a re, it's almost like a religion, and that's a belief. And it's we are what I really love about our country is we can believe whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And I think I told you this. So, you know, a, a, a Muslim, a Jew, a, a Baptist, Christian, a Catholic, uh, and an atheist can all build a house together mm -hmm. with the same tools, because the house and the tools don't care what they believe, right? So. Mm -hmm. If if this is a social construct, then it 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 doesn't and it doesn't match with what the reality is. Then we need to be, start becoming aware of those things because we feel really comfortable that we've done a good job brief and we have the closest hospital. But it doesn't might not mean exactly in this situation. We like to paint everybody the same. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody can text and drive because somebody died texting and driving. But the reality is, texting and driving is bad. But if you're look looking to fail safely, you can go climb a pole that doesn't look that great if you tie three ropes on it. Right. You know, so there, there's making everything the same is not necessarily the answer. Well, so one of, you mentioned the safety stand down earlier, and I almost think it's kind of um, maybe similar to, to what you were talking about with the job or even in terms of like this ritual that we have, um, you know, because you and I have talked about the safety stand downs before. Um, and sometimes we have, you know, there are organizations that might have like an annual safety stand down. Like, what are your thoughts about that? But having been a lineman, I've been in them. Um, and then as a project manager, you, we hate them because if you bid a job and you're doing it, trying to, because so utility has a, has a, a work base and I'm, I, I don't have, I was a utility lineman and then I worked for a contractor also. Mm -hmm. So the utility lineman, um, they don't have, aren't pressured as much as the contractor linemen because the contractor linemen have to make money or the contractor doesn't stay in business. And when the utility holds a safety stand on as a project manager, it just put more pressure on my job because now um, I didn't bid for two days for my crew not to do any work and still have to pay them. Uh, you know, and, and also whatever the thing that is that happened might also be an expense. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's, that, that's a difficult thing. So I spoke uh, recently at a conference in, in Buffalo, New York, and, uh, and I did this. And I do this quite frequently. First, I ask people not to get defensive and not to maybe judge themselves or me. Um, I just need to ask the question, you know, what happens if you have a serious incident right now? And eventually they get to, well, we're going to have a safety stand down. And I say, so that's really interesting. What does it look like? And it, pretty much across the board, it looks similar. And just for the record, all of the fatalities that I've looked up in the last year, every company had a safety stand down. And every stand down looked very similar. Mm -hmm. We're going to stop the crews. We're going to do go through lessons learned and uh, tap root, do a tap root and determine what the causal factors are, make sure everybody's aware because we don't want that thing to ever happen again. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to control risk so that thing never happens again. And really, what that is, is a corporate reaction. Mm -hmm. So, right now, if I offend you badly enough, it, it, um, said something really terse. You're going to react and say something terse back. And then we both might regret what we said. 
But that's not us. That's a reaction. And if we take a few, you know, I like to, what I do for myself is count backwards, five, four, three, two, one in my head to unhack that. Well, yeah. And they, t I mean, they talk about it in therapy too. It's about being responsive, not reactive. So you don't necessarily need to react right away. Maybe take a few minutes or a few days to chew on things and see what the best path forward is. So that's exactly what, so yeah, you're, you, you know, we were doing this too long, Kate. We start to think too much alike. <laughs> we're synced. You know? so, so I asked them, so it sounds like you have a system and a process in place for when these serious events occur. And they said, oh, absolutely. And and for most of you in the room, well, if not all of you, it's a safety standout. They said, yes. So now I'm going to ask the question, and it's going to make you uncomfortable. I just want to, a little trigger warning. Are you having that safety stand down because the last one worked so well to prevent the next accident? And they all kind of had that nervous laugh. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little painful, but the reality is they're going to go do it again because they don't, because it's a reaction. So it, what we have to do. Do you also think though that some of it is about cognitive load too? Like it's easy. I don't want to say easy, but, um, for us to do the same things over and over again, rather than have to put in like the brain power to figure out how to do something differently and test that out and all that kind of thing. Are you a neuroscientist? Maybe. Maybe. I think you might be. In training? Yeah, I think you, you <laughs> might be because that's, that's the neuroscience talks about that a lot. Like if you put a GPS locator on yourself, you'll find your brain likes it when you follow the same path every day. Well, yeah, it's that thinking fast and slow. It's the Daniel Kahneman that we were talking about earlier. Right, right. So if, if it looks easy, our brain loves it. Mm -hmm. Oh, th this is what we do. Is it? And it doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's easy. And then when you're System one brain, and we'll talk about that maybe in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, we you're... might have to go into a second podcast for all these yeah, events. Exactly. About. It could happen. It, but this is still influencing safety too, right? Because mm -hmm. because if these things influence us, and then what we do, we create a ritual and a myth that isn't producing a different result. But then we get the Einstein quote, right? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results, Instead. and we don't get them. Yeah. And in ten years, we haven't got them. So it doesn't mean the information is bad. It mean, means we're not translating whatever we're doing into the worker's physical reality. So if something actually changes. So so uh, I'm lost for a minute here, but I I think the job reef is necessary. It's a compliance issue. Yeah. Um, in most states, OSHA doesn't require that you even have a written one or sign it. Correct. Um, yeah. But we like to go always go above and beyond because that's what we do as a species. Well, and if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Right. Whatever. And the reality is, in the job brief, the thing we write down from conscious awareness is different than when we're in, in connected and synced with each other in that circle. And you're telling me what your concern is. And when you say your concern, it, dr it drives something in my mind. That's not written down. That's called up. And a lot of us think, well, that's, you know, we're too woo -woo wishy washy. No. Gut instinct is real. And actually, in the latest book, I'm reading The Source. I can't even think of her name who writes it. She talks about how there's neurons in your gut that report to your brain. And when you have a stomach ache, your intuition isn't as good because those gut neurons are interfered with because they're inflamed. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That's fascinating. Yeah. So, so, so the stuff we call up because we're synchronized and you say something that triggers something as me is as reliable and important as the things we write down, as the things with the, that we notice consciously. But we need to create an environment where we both can occur. And the job brief... Is something where somebody sits in the cab, writes up a really nice, really well-written job brief. And the more beautiful it is, the more written it is, of course, the better the job will go. Well, can I get Which is not true, right? No, oh. that was not true. <laughs> I didn't want to stop. <laughs> well, that, I was being facetious. Or what's the word, sarcastic? Yeah. Probably. No. <laughs> not you. Yeah. Uh, no, I just wanted to go back to the safety stand-down for one more second. So, you know, if they're not working... You know, if it's if it's more of a ritual, are there other things that we can do post incident, you know, that are going to make an impact that are going to be helpful in some way in preventing something from happening the next time? So so think that I'm really glad you asked that. Um, and we might have talked about this in one of the other podcasts, but this is a good place for its application. So information is not knowledge unless it's applied. We're in the information age and we think because we put all this information out in posters and all this stuff that. But we told you 
but we need action in order for our brain, because our brain's concrete. It needs positive action. So let's say we're on a five-man crew that goes back in the woods a mile, and this is a true story, and it's a crappy-looking pole, so they they test it, they hammer hit it, and they dig the hole, which is all another story. You know, The reason they're picking the hammer up is because they know so much about poles. They already know something. They already decided it's a piece of crap, but we fall to the rule. So they climb the pole, it breaks off, it rolls a, down a 100-foot bank, did that. The woman the apprentice breaks her femur, the guy breaks his back and his face. Imagine the, what the other three guys on that crew experience. Oh my, that's terrifying and traumatized. So they're going to be PTHD. No, not PTHD. <laughs> survival- PTSD. PTSD, yeah. yeah. Okay, it is early. Um, I did have a Coke. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, and I don't drink soda, so it could be a problem. But but the the reality is, what if in the stand down, we just did a little mental simulation of of what that crew experienced? We affect a different part of the brain, right? Um, and when we affect that part of the brain, it file it, it creates a circuit because neurons that fire together wire together, and then your subconscious is going to try to avoid that thing for you. And the, the sad thing is, when your subconscious changes your decision and when the event doesn't happen, we won't know, right? I did I do that thing about the broken face on your podcast yet? I don't think so. But what's so funny is I heard a guy talking about it in the hall the other day. I was like, oh my God, he must have been talking to Bill because tell the story. So so I, I, if the, as the listeners are listening, I'm going to affect two parts of their brain. And the first part is I, you know, I've flown a lot of really serious things and several people have had all, broke all the bones in their face, which can be kind of ugly too, because when you break the bones, you affect the flesh on your face and it's kind of ugly looking. And, and you, the audience is listening like, oh, that would hurt. But when I tell them how I knew, it affects a different part of their brain. I just did it in, the, in my talk yesterday. That's kind of fun to do. You know, I shouldn't smile when I'm doing it because it's kind of gross. <laughs> but but the, I, said, I asked them, do you know how I knew the, the face was broken? They said, well, no. I said, well, uh, I asked them, I asked the patient, so what, is it, you know, what does it feel like? And a couple of them have said this, I can move the roof of my mouth with my tongue. And how many people who are listening right now just tried to touch the top, so <laughs> the top of the, their exactly. mouth? Exactly. In, in the class yesterday, the, there was a couple people that didn't. One was a paramedic, one was a police officer. So for our, and a, an ex-military. Mm-hmm. Um, so our, your audience, a high percentage of your audience, just involuntarily the, the, touched the roof of the roof of the mouth with their tongue yeah. because their body had to do an immediate, had immediate assessment. Oh, we don't want that thing to happen. So that hit the part of the brain that, is doing it things without you. And with that assessment, it fired a circuit, just like when you were a kid and touched that pan and burned your finger because mm-hmm. you didn't think it would hurt you. And now your subconscious's job is not to allow you to break through, break your face. So you won't know if it stops you. The other side of this is if you don't keep that seed alive and plant water, give it water and let it grow, um, then that'll eventually be pruned and you can break your face. But if you revisit that periodically, it'll keep that circuit alive. Just like if you're learning the violin and you don't practice, you don't get good. But if you practice regularly, you get better. And then when you stop for a while, you're a little clunky. Yeah. So, so what? What if on safety stand downs, we actually uh, helped everybody in in our company experience with those three people that had to respond to that? So the response to the event is pretty pretty uh, mind taxing. You know, we need to if we practice where we create a shared mental model. We uh, we know where the first aid kit is, and we know if it's up to date. Uh, where's the AED? How long is it going to take the ambulance to get here? Do we need to move the patient? How are we going to do that? And when we do a, a mental rehearsal, we can fail safely at that because it's not happening. So one of the things that I think, you know, we're kind of talking about in general here is it's really about people and people connecting with each other and people sharing and learning together. And and that might be the next piece is like, we've got to get everybody more connected, break down silos, um, you know, and get people knowing each other and working with each other so that, because I think that's the best way to be safer and be more productive, I guess. I, I think you're, I, I love your, the way your brain works. You know that, right? So for the audience to know something right now, that when we first started doing these podcast series, you would have a list of questions. Yeah. And we were meeting online. And now we both met this morning. It's early. Retired, and but we are we are now synchronized to the point where we don't have a list of questions, 
this conversation is real. It's not pretend. We're not fully organic. Yeah, yeah we're, we're we're allowing each other this thought process, and that's what has to happen on the job. Is the more we're connected, um, the more we reach to to this level of flow. Mm -hmm. And and I and I, that's why I really I like doing these because it's you're fun to do this with. Yeah. And Nick is here recording this whole thing at the same time, which is this is kind of cool, you know. It's all good. Um, well, there's one more thing I want to uh, touch on. I want to do a, probably a second uh, podcast on myths, um, but just in the interest of time and everything, I want to talk about the Swiss cheese model and James Reason. Okay, so I, I'm going to just brief. James Reason was brilliant, right? He, he created the Swiss cheese model in 2000, I think it was, and a lot of uh, a lot of companies live by that. Mm -hmm. and we really like that. Um, and I, if you look at the layers of safety where we make sure every layer, that's really smart. But the picture of it that everybody knows is those layers of Swiss cheese with an arrow going through all the holes that line up and create and hit a target. And that model um, is not healthy, uh, in my opinion. And some of these, some of the safety people out there right now are about ready to stab me. But I'm going to uh, bear with me for a minute. So, Daniel Kahneman, I'm going to switch to Daniel Kahneman and we'll go back to James Reason. Daniel Kahneman wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. And in there he had a metaphor, he named Mr. Versky, for the fast thinking brain and slow thinking brain. And I do a lot of things with that um, to prove it. But in the, in the, just for time, um, I'm going to do a quick math question. What I want you to pay attention to is not the math question, is the answer that jumps in your in your head and almost immediately to all of you. So the you have a little lily pad pond behind your house. And every spring, uh, the lily pads start to grow back. And they double the acreage of the pond every day until they cover the entire pond. Mm -hmm. And you know the answer because you're dumb. I do. Right? So, so I'm, try I'm trying to play dumb. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so so that means that the lily pads double, then they double, then they double the whole pond. And it takes 48 days to cover the whole pond. How long to cover half the pond is the question I have. And the interesting thing about that is the number that jumps into everybody's head right now 24. is 24. Mm -hmm. And system one brain loves that because now, hey, dude, I don't your your brain burns 25% of all of the food you eat and the air you breathe. It's 2% of your body weight. You got an answer. Don't exert any more of my energy on that. And not only that, but it, it's a bully and it blocks you from trying to calculate it. So if, if your audience is hearing this right now, for many of you, uh, the answer you're thinking it's 24. It gets worse if you're in a board meeting and the CEO says it's 24, it's over. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. Right? <laughs> but the reality is when you really calculate the, you don't need to calculate it. That's, that's the reality. It doubles every day and it takes 48 days to cover the whole pond. That means the day before it was half covered, 47 days. And it's a ridiculously easy answer, but your system one doesn't like you to think about it when it has already given you an answer. This is why I was bad at math problems, I guess. So James Reason's science is spot on. But the model of an arrow, all the holes lining up, is the definition of an anomaly. Well, and, they, and actually yesterday we were at SDG&E and they were kind of talking about like that, like how many, I think they were talking about the Maui fire and about how, how so many things had to line up. Um, and it was just like, you know, 14 or 15 things all at once, which... That's not going to happen a lot. So we're talking about an anomaly. So yeah. here's here's what happened. Let's let's apply the Swiss cheese model picture, not not his whole theory, to 9/11. 9/11 should never have happened, right? When and some of the people on here are going to say, "Well, that was like a conspiracy theory anyway," and I don't care. I have no control over what it was, and we're welcome to believe anything we want and still build the house. So so whatever what, what, it was an anomaly. It should not have. We have the best military in the world. That thing shouldn't have happened. And now what we're going to do is we're going to, we don't want that thing ever to happen again because all the holes lined up. We're going to do all these things to control the risk so that thing never happens again. We're going to create Homeland Security. And I'm going to have to take my belt and my shoes off every time I get on an airplane. And we're going to start a war in Iraq. We're going to do all these things for an anomaly that may never occur again. And that I did some research. In 2000, there were exactly zero deaths from foreign terrorists in our country. The year be yeah. and it was the two in, in, in two thousand. Mm -hmm. um, in two thousand five, there might have been five. I, I think it got to as high as nine sometimes. And then the news would report that as there's a five hundred percent increase in foreign terrorist deaths. 
it was five, went from zero to five. And yeah, they're just it, twisting the number. So you got to be careful because it, that's a trigger. I mean, anti-Semitism went up, they said 400% because Probably, what's, yes, for like, what went on. And that's an interesting number. I don't know what the number is, but I'm guessing it's so small they couldn't use it, so they had to go to percentages, mm -hmm. right? But Because the, they need to sell commercials. So back to the 9-11. So we do all these things to try to prevent an act from thing from never happening again. When the reality is the odds of dying by foreign terrorists before 9-11 was 50 million to one. And the odds after 9-11 is 50 million to one. Because when all the holes line up, that's the definition of an anomaly. And we lose our, we lose ourselves. I was going to say you lose a, I was going to say a bad word. <laughs> we, we lose, we lose it when something bad happens because we react to it. And now we're going to do everything we can to stop that thing that's never going to happen again anyway from happening again. When really what we need to do is get in front and we do the safety stand down so everybody experiences what that people, those, so we make a small subconscious course correction that we're not even aware of. But, but we don't have a parade for things that don't happen. We, we only celebrate the bad things. So if we can change, if we can get in front of 9-11 and say, what happened? What, where did we switch course where we missed that entire event? And change that. Mm -hmm. So it now never happens again. Rather than create Homeland Security to fix it on the tail end. And I, I, I think that's, we can still work on things and lessons learned. That's all good. And we can start looking at doing things that change the course correction. But if we believe in myths and legends, so so maybe I can close with this. Okay. Um, Yuval Noah Harari wrote the book Sapiens. And he said, 100,000 years ago when we learned to make fire, we could cook our food and then we could allow our brains to grow as big as they are because we could get enough protein. A chimpanzee would have the same size brain as ours, but it spends all day finding food. Mm -hmm. When we didn't have to do that, our brain could get bigger because we could, our body could support it. Um, when we began to believe in myths and legend, uh, then we could convince each other of them. So when we convince each other of them, we really like that because we love it when we agree. That affects the dopamine center, right? The same place as chocolate and sex in your head. So it's the pleasure center. And, but, and when we all agree and we're nodding our heads, it doesn't mean we're right. It means we agree. So, uh, uh, no, Yuval Noah Harari and the, the Sapiens said, when we agree on our myth and legend, and then we run across a group that doesn't agree, we kill them. Actually, we don't. We kill the men. Then we take the women and children, and we create a larger group th that agrees with our myth and legend. And what's really sad for me this year is I thought we were, as a species, we were evolving. But if you look around the country with the wars that are going on, we're still doing that. We're entitled to believe whatever we want. The bomb that lands in Palestine and the bomb that lands in Israel doesn't care. It's a bomb. The only thing that changes is the justification for sending it. So, so if we can start looking at some of the things we're doing in the industry and see that it's a social construct, it's not really changing anything in physical reality, let's add the thing we, and we can add the thing to it we need to make it actually purposeful. That, that, that changes something. So the, here's the question you ask. Well, that was a really good meeting, right? I love this meeting. I love this conference. Great. What am I going to, what's going to change Monday morning with my guys at work from this great meeting and this great conference? What thing can I apply that from this, everything I learned to change one thing? That's real. That's not a myth. You're awesome, Bill. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, and everybody, please check out Bill's previous podcast interviews on uh, utilitysafety.podbean.com or anywhere that you download the podcast. Uh, until next time, stay safe and be well. The views, information, and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of utility business media and its employees. It is strongly recommended that you discuss any actions or policy changes with your company management prior to implementation.